Now, Douglas, uh, you write your column this week about two underreported stories about the uh, Israel-Hamas conflict. Uh, tell us about them. Well, yes, it, uh, it's uh, extraordinary to me that at the same time the world is understandably talking about the refugees in Gaza, there is almost no international attention on the tens of thousands of Israeli families who are refugees within Israel. Uh, the Israeli government doesn't like, call them refugees. They are known as internally displaced people. But these are the thousands, tens of thousands of people from the north of Israel who were moved south uh, on October the 7th and who cannot return to their homes because they're all uh, being regularly uh, assaulted by rockets from Hezbollah in the south of Lebanon. Um, and of course, also people from the south of Israel who were moved out on the 7th by the Israeli government because they're also under rocket fire from Gaza. Um, uh, these people get absolutely no attention on them. I mentioned a bit about this in the piece. It's very striking to me um, why that is. Uh, the second thing that I mentioned in the piece that is almost completely uh, unreported upon in the press outside of Israel is the fact that, as I say in my column this week, uh, in my view, the war may well have not yet begun. And what I mean by that is that uh, uh, Hamas is the, in British car terms, the Ford Cortina of Iran. Uh, it's being smashed. And uh, in my view, I hope that it's 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 smashed completely. I, I think there's no point, uh, as Minister Benny Gantz said this week, of putting out three quarters of a fire. You either put out the whole of a fire or or you don't bother. Uh, and the way in which David Cameron and others this week have been calling on Israel to effectively stop uh, stop fighting the fire is, I think, profoundly unhelpful. But but uh, if, if uh, Hamas is the Ford Cortina proxy of Iran, Hezbollah is its Lamborghini. And by that, I mean that, you know, this is about 160,000 much higher grade missiles that Hezbollah has stored in the south of Lebanon in an area that, of course, after the 2006 war, the UN passed a resolution that was meant to be demilitarized and stripped of such rockets. But, of course, the international community didn't abide by that resolution, 1701. Uh, and so, in my view, uh, uh, as long as the because these two things connect, as long as the citizens of Israel cannot live in their homes in the north of the country, um, this war cannot be over. And then the real war is the much bigger war uh, against Hezbollah, the other proxy of Iran, in southern Lebanon. And I'm not sure that outside of the region, it's widely understood that this is the situation. When I hear comments from uh, Foreign Secretary Lord Cameron and others, you might get the impression that the Gaza war is all there is to this. And that is such a massive miscalculation, a demonstration of ignorance of the actual situation. You also write in terms of different angles which haven't really been covered on this conflict about the tens of thousands of Israelis who've been displaced and lost uh, their homes. Uh, tell us about that. Well, I say there that, I mean, these are, th these are people for whom there seems to be no particular international notice or international sympathy. Um, uh, I've lived among them uh, for some months and uh, it's, it's a terrible thing. I mean, uh, many of them have been put up in hotels by the Israeli government. And some people might say, well, that sounds OK. Actually, you know, it might be fun to live with your whole family in a hotel room for a week. It's not much fun for months on end, let alone if uh, it's clear that you can't return to your home for the foreseeable future. These are all children missing out on their educations or at least missing out on much of their education. Uh, people unable to do their work, farmers unable uh, to tend to their crops or fields. Um, I'm just sort of startled by the fact that this gets so little attention. And one of the only things I think justifies or explains why it is, is because, of course, these people are being looked after by the Israeli government. They're Israeli citizens, Israeli civilians of a bewildering array of backgrounds and uh, and religions. But they are they are Israeli civilians being looked after by the Israeli government. I suppose that as the world watches what's happening in Gaza, um, perhaps it thinks, uh, you know, that, that Israel also has to have um, all total control and responsibility for all Gazan civilians. But actually, of course, the civilians of Gaza were meant to be under the protection of Hamas and the governance of Hamas. But then we can see how well that worked out. 
Um, but yes, I mean, in a way, the Israeli displaced are being ignored because their government is actually looking after them. Mm. Ironic. And what would an escalation in northern Israel look like? You talk about, uh, you know, the border there. Hezbollah has around 160,000 rockets on the border there. What would any escalation in that region look like? Well, I've been up there a lot recently, as I have over the years. I was there during the 2006 conflict uh, 18 years ago. Uh, as Hezbollah was shelling the north of Israel and rocketing it. Um, and I've been up there quite a lot in recent months uh, in places like Mount Moron and uh, Matula and Kiret Shimona and elsewhere. And I can tell you that uh, both sides, both Hezbollah and Israel, have an interest in downplaying the amount of activity on that border. Uh, but I can tell you from my own eyewitness that uh, there's a lot more activity than anyone is admitting. Um, artillery, um, air assaults, uh, rockets being fired regularly uh, by Hezbollah, uh, RPGs, uh, anti-tank, much more. Uh, um, the, the whole area is an absolute tinderbox. And uh, as I was up on Mount Moron the other week, actually, four Hamas uh, fighters, in a, 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 I mean, consider that, that doesn't get much attention, four Hamas from Lebanon. Um, crossed the border into Israel on a uh, mission to kill um, Israelis, and they were killed themselves, and they injured quite a lot of IDF. Um, but th these things get almost no international notice. Um, but you know, if you go to a place like Matula, a small town which is surrounded all three on three sides um, by Hezbollah, you know, you can see the Hezbollah bases; they're absolutely everywhere. The Hezbollah listening posts. Uh, the Hezbollah rocket uh, um, uh, bases. Uh, these are all there. And, and I reiterate, it's so, it's so strange because, you know, 18 years after I was last seeing that there, uh, and 18 years after that conflict was meant to have ended with this not happening and with the international community ensuring that Hezbollah could not have this knife at Israel's throat. There it is, um, bigger and better and glossier than ever, Hezbollah's armory in Lebanon. And uh, this, is, this is, of course, a tragedy uh, uh, for Lebanon, among other things. Uh, Hezbollah has, ha has helped to ruin that country. Um, but yes, uh, the, the eradication of this arsenal has to happen at some point. Um, one Israeli told me a little while ago that he thought there was maybe a 30% chance, 30% chance, of there actually being a diplomatic solution to this, i.e. the international community might actually enforce its own resolution and persuade Hezbollah to remove its arsenals uh, from the, the, the area that's meant to be demilitarized. But that, is, as math geniuses will have noticed, is a minority, therefore, likelihood. It's much more likely that uh, Hezbollah and Israel are on a kind of tandem bicycle cycling downhill and Whoever stops pedaling first, we don't know, but it's going to crash. Um, the, uh, the I think a lot of people outside the region don't realize that there's, there's basically two reasons why Hezbollah has this weaponry in the south of Lebanon. One is just to use it at any point or at some point against Israel. And as I say, it's, it's using it a lot. Just the other night, they fired a barrage of about 50 or 60 missiles. They keep on testing the Iron Dome. There were 30 again the other day. Um, it's pretty extraordinary to see. Uh, but yes, these, these pretty significant barrages go off on a regular basis now, are mainly shot down, but are not always shot down by Israel's Iron Dome. But maybe that is why Hezbollah has this buildup of weaponry. But there's a second reason, of course, which is that it, it, it exists there in order to be used or have the threat of using it at such a time as Israel, America, or any other international force um, in any way struck Iran, the revolutionary Islamic government in Iran, in order to stop it getting to the final point of its long desired nuclear ambitions. Um, if there were a strike against Iran by Israel, by America or others to stop it getting to the final stage of getting a nuclear bomb, which as I say the regime in Tehran has been very clear that it has wanted for decades now, uh, if if there was such a strike, arguably that's when uh, Iran would uh, get Hezbollah to start firing. And, and people shouldn't underestimate this threat, both the Iranian nuclear threat, which lots of people have put to the back of their minds in recent years, 
um, but is still going on, it's still very much the ambition of the regime in Tehran. Um, so the first thing is that they shouldn't underestimate that. And the second thing is they shouldn't underestimate the nature of the arsenal of weaponry in uh, Hezbollah that Hezbollah owns and has stored in southern Lebanon. Uh, many of these are much more advanced missiles um, than the ones that Hamas has had. Uh, partly, of course, because although there wasn't a successful blockade on stopping rockets getting into Gaza, there was some blockade. Um, and uh, but these the the, the uh, Lebanese Hezbollah have Iranian weaponry of a pretty high caliber uh, that could reach much, if not most, of Israel. And uh, that's just an intolerable situation for any country uh, to live under. And as I say, these two issues, if you bring them together, the displaced people in the north of Israel and the munitions that Hezbollah has stockpiled pointing in their direction. Uh, you see that, as I say in the column this week, arguably the war in the Middle East has not yet begun. Everything we've had so far is a prelude. Mm -hmm.